He received the St. George. Well, your bio is long. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. You can just do this. <laughs> He received the St. George National Award, the highest award given by the American Cancer Society for lifetime efforts in cancer control, and has been awarded the Bridgman Distinguished Dentist Award from the West Virginia Dental Association, the Distinguished Leadership Award from the West Virginia Public Health Association, a Presidential Certificate of Appreciation from the American Academy of Oral, oral Medicine, Honorary Life Membership from the International Association of Oral Pathologists, and the Distinguished Alumni Award from University of Minnesota and both the Fleming and Davenport Award for Original Research and the Award for Pioneer Work in Teaching and Research from the University of Texas. So please give a warm Academy welcome to Dr. Jerry Bucco. Thank you. Well, this has been uh, so heavy, the topic, that I kind of myself as uh, not the comedy, comedy, comedy relief, but entertainment. Um, one of the things that was mentioned uh, about me was I spent uh, a bone fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, which at the time was one of the two places you went for bone um, work, mostly bone tumors. And it turns out the guy who took me in, Dave Dahlin, was a fellow who was, we got along very well because his ancestors were Swedish and so were mine. And he admitted once we got to know each other, he said, I just laughed when I got your application because a dentist coming in to, uh, to a bone pathology fellowship. And as it turns out, I probably saw 30 or 40 jaws out of 5,000 <laughs> bone, bone samples during that time. But uh, I taught him a few things, so he was actually willing to learn, and there were new things coming up in oral path that he wasn't aware of. So it was interesting, but one of the things you can uh, see on the front screen is uh, a quote from him. He said, the jaws are really different. So I have been collecting all my life things that make the jaws different. And I don't know of anybody else who can do that because I read more bone papers from other bones than I do jaw bones. And so I'm, I'm constantly comparing what goes on in our world and what goes on in the other world. And over the years, I started with the first time I gave a talk like this, I had six differences. And when I uh, was asked to give this, I had 22 differences. And this morning while I was sitting in the back, I thought, no, there's some overlap here. So we're going to... Uh, 18. So let's take a look at some of these. Uh, I also has this, this topic has led me to some interesting um, situations. Uh, I, I read a lot of novels and uh, one of them was a, a Folio Society a book out of England and this drawing was in there. A fellow went down into the basement of a church and found this skeleton and was uh, sort of fascinated by the whole thing. So I contacted the artist and I said, can I use that for my oral path lectures? <laughs> and he just laughed and said, you can have it, use it any way you want, <laughs> that's fine. So uh, that is uh, I, one of the most intriguing paintings that I've ever uh, encountered. For somebody who really likes jawbones, uh, that's it. So uh, I've got the 22 differences in here, but I, I guess I forgot to name the uh, differences um, or change the number. And uh, before I get into this, something weird happened this week. Um, on my way back from giving a talk in, I think it was Italy, back in the uh, mid 80s, I had a long flight and I could never sleep on a plane. So, I, little guy, sorry, every once in a while I'm kicking out. Uh, Mario, the uh, computer game guy, was uh, very popular around that time, so I decided to make a drawing of him. I wanted to use it with my students to emphasize that diagnosing things in the mouth is, uh, is really a detective work kind of a thing. You can't approach it with a fixed idea. And I gave it to a friend of mine who uh, redrew it. She's an artist, uh, redrew it uh, in a much better fashion. Well, we're going to use this for a diagnostic tool from the University of Texas. And just a few days ago, I got this other drawing back. And it said, uh, well, we, we like what you've done, 
but we've redesigned it to avoid gender and race bias. <laughs> so apparently Mario is out um, in the politically correct world. And I'm not upset by it, but I do have something. There's a cufflink on that coat, which makes it more of a male coat than a female coat. So uh, I do have some criticism of them then. <laughs> Let's look at these. Some of these are, I think, obvious, but you haven't thought about it before. Uh, the jaws, without the jaws, you couldn't have facial recognition. And uh, there are lots of people who have shown, oh, let's see, there we go. Uh, the arrow's quite a bit smaller on that screen. You've seen uh, lots of TV shows where they find a skeleton and they reproduce the face and then somebody identifies the person when they publicize that face. And that's, uh, without the jaws, uh, that facial recognition cannot work. Um, it just doesn't work. The jaws, yes, we have eye, eye recognition, and with masks on, we've come to really appreciate that. But uh, relative to computer recognition, you've got to have the jawbones showing. Jaw bones showing. And my mentor at the Mayo Clinic, Dave Darlene, uh, he, he always, kind of dislike the fact that regular physicians didn't seem to appreciate bones much at all. So he would frequently in his lectures uh, just kind of in, tell them how important they are and his words were, uh, just imagine what you'd look like without uh, these bones. Well, let's get a little more closer to the surface. Uh, there is, uh, can you think of any other bones that are as close to the surface as ours? You can, the sinuses, but that's part of the maxillofacial area, except the frontal sinus. But there is one other place, and that other place has uh, actually a lot of entities or disease problems that are similar to the jaw bones, and that's the external auditory meatus, the external ear canal. The uh, mucous membrane there, skin form of mucous membrane, is very, very close to the surface, and they get infections in the skull base and they get ischemic problems from that uh, tissue being so close to the bone. And of course we get that too. Alveolar bone is only uh, depending on the person and maybe how much edema they have in their tissues, uh, 0.5 to 1.3 millimeters of soft tissue covering the bone. And if you think about it, uh, there's what, I mean even the shin bone has probably uh, nine, to, 9 to 10 millimeters of tissue above it. So we are working in the bone, bones that seem to be the closest to the surface and therefore we have a lot of trouble because of that closeness to the surface. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things about, uh, that I just read maybe a few months ago was uh, in mice people produce gingivitis and then instead of looking at the top of the bone to see why the bone dissolves under that inflammation, they went into the bone marrow and they assumed that they were going to find inflammatory factors, but what they found was ischemia. The signals that were coming out down from the inflammation was causing poor blood flow in the bone marrow and then the microscopic features associated with that. And recently in Europe, um, there have been some people who have looked at some of these ischemic bone problems that I've been dealing with all of my life. And they've been finding uh, cytokines, uh, growth factors, all kinds of things um, in the bone underlying the, the uh, inflammation on the surface. And of course, if we have a torus, if we have an exostosis, uh, you'd think that they grow so, so slowly that the mucosa would have a chance to adapt. It's pretty flexible stuff, but it doesn't seem to. It seems to stretch over those bony masses. And sort of a corollary to this is sinus. Sinuses produce all kinds of problems, including problems that our, our teeth will present, uh, problems a patient has caused, sometimes problems we have caused. And uh, one of the things, of course, that you would most likely see in the sinus relative to dentistry is uh, pyogenic granuloma of the sinus. Uh, we also have these uh, pseudocysts of the sinus that even after you treat the tooth they remain maybe for the rest of the patient's life. And uh, most recently I got all excited because it doesn't take much to get an oral pathologist excited. That picture on the uh, lower right, oh, 
There we go. The picture on the lower right uh, shows literally like a volcano. This was a periapical granuloma, not a cyst, and it had actually perforated the bone. And that is pretty atypical, but we're finding more and more of it now that we're, everybody's using cone beams, CTs. And uh, what makes this most interesting is the bone not only perforated, which I see frequently above a periapical lesion, uh, just holes in the bone, but the bone responded by raising itself up. And that is, I've never seen that before. And so uh, it is something that uh, is kind of super cool to me. One of the odd, oddest facts that I've run into, and this was back, there were two papers back in the 1990s, for the first time in uh, the stroke, the journal Stroke, they were both published in that journal. For the first time, they looked at things that happened 30 days before somebody had a stroke. And uh, they looked, of course, at cholesterol, weight, exercise levels, that sort of thing, genetics. And they found, uh, they also asked any about this event th within 30 days. And they found the number one risk, according to their statistics, was an infection somewhere in the body 30 days before. And we all know when you get bacteremia, it enhances the coagulation. And uh, we also know now that six to 15% of us, depending on the country, have a tendency to make too many clots. It's called a hypercoagulation state, uh, several other names for it. But what was interesting about this was six months later, another paper in stroke was published totally different group. They hadn't obviously talked to each other. And they asked the same question, got the same results, but they asked one more question. What was the infection? And 80% of those infections were in either the jaws, the mouth, or in the sinuses. And uh, there's no cause and effect that we can conclude from that. But isn't it interesting that uh, this is the kind of thing that is more, according to these papers, more significant a risk than your cholesterol levels, your, uh, your obesity, your lack of exercise, and all of those other things. And uh, one of the things that uh, we tend to forget about, because it really doesn't cause too many problems, is that when we have the, the microscopic picture, you see the, the respiratory epithelium at the top is very, very close to the bone, and the bone has all kinds of holes in it anyway. And so uh, why not, uh, why, why can't we get more inflammation? It should be no big deal for inflammation to get up into the sinuses. And microscopically it's there. Clinically it isn't enough to produce a large mass uh, typically. But that does happen with some frequency. And why don't we have more sinusitis in people who have bad teeth? Uh, you've all run into people who have bad teeth because of sinusitis. They say my, my whole upper, all the teeth in the upper right hurt. And it really is from sinusitis above the teeth. But um, that's just one of the mysteries that I'm leaving with you because I'm retired. <laughs> Number three, it's the only bone, these are the only bones, not only is it close the, to the surface, to the outside air, but these are the only bones where we place a lot of stuff in them. And I really didn't know how popular chewing tobacco was until I moved from Minnesota to West Virginia. And uh, I asked my class, before I talked about it, I asked these third-year dental students to raise your hand. How many of you chew tobacco regularly? And uh, about 75% <laughs> raised their hands. Uh, it was a very, very common uh, habit back then. It's changed quite a bit now. But we put that in. We put hot candies. We put hot food. We put cinnamon kinds of, um, of uh, products in there. And uh, in addition to that, you and I as uh, dentists, uh, we put a lot of vasoconstrictors right next to it. Vasoconstrictors that we use are designed to cut down blood flow 75% for maybe 40 to 50 minutes. If you put chewing tobacco in that same site, the blood flow cut down during the 15 minutes while it's, you've got the most active resorption of nicotine is 75%. Uh, so what we're doing is pretty similar to just what somebody has when they have uh, putting, they're routinely putting tobacco right up against their uh, alveolar bone. 
And of course, in my state, it's not at all unusual for somebody to come in and all the molars and premolars are gone on one, in one quadrant, lower quadrant. They don't have a lot of tooth decay. I mean, there is a lot of tooth decay, but not these, they didn't lose it because of periodontal disease or tooth problems. They lost it because of a fairly painless and fairly non-inflammatory, at least clinically, um, vasoconstriction, lack of healing because of the vasoconstriction, I'm assuming. So uh, these, are some, these are things that uh, are right, right down the line, and I have, all, by the way, I'm working on a paper from my uh, Houston experience, on, um, we found 12 different things that had never been reported about cocaine. People putting uh, cocaine in their mouth and smoking cocaine and the problems associated with that. And uh, we found one thing that people, and I, I found it in the 1800s literature, dental and medical literature, if you have a toothache, one of the things that makes it feel better is to put cocaine, powdered cocaine, just get it moist and push it right up against the tooth. And that's still going on apparently, but I didn't know about it until I got down to Houston. And uh, the vasoconstriction, I don't want to um, belabor that because it's just a question, but of course, there are people who have injected into the hard palate. It's a kind of a painful injection. And uh, they can rip the periosteum away from the bone and uh, we can end up with a necrosis called a vasoconstrictor ulcer, anesthetic ulcer, something of that nature. So that really doesn't happen much in other bones. Number four, uh, we've got epithelium and the outside world very, very close to our bones. However, we have a place that doesn't, that doesn't have any epithelium on it, right? We have that area around the teeth is essentially glued to the rest of your skin or the rest of your uh, epithelium. There is no covering, so you don't even have to have a break in the surface in order to run into a problem. Is a break in the surface of serious consequences to um, maybe we'll say orthopedic surgeons? Well, because of my bone pathology uh, fellowship, uh, for the first 20 years I was at WVU, the bone people asked me to give a monthly seminar on bone path, and I did that. And uh, after a while, they asked if each of their residents could spend a month with me in my office, and I'd give them a little seminar every, every morning. And the last session, I would just sit down with them and just chit-chat and say it was a good time we had and I hope you learned something. And I always ask them, you know what a dentist does when he pulls a tooth or she pulls a tooth? And um, they hadn't really thought about it. And I said, we just throw the tooth away. <laughs> and um, they, they do it literally two people a year for almost 20 years, they would look shocked. You mean... You've got exposed bone there and you don't do anything about it? And I said, yeah, and we get away with it. No, doesn't seem to be a big problem. In their world, if there's exposed bone, the very first thing you wanna do is get that bone under the skin again, because if it gets infected, it's going to mean amputation. Um, antibiotics certainly help, but it can still mean a amputation. So that's their men mindset. And in dentistry, we pull a tooth and I don't, maybe we'll rinse out the socket. Some people like to scrape the periodontal ligament out, but um, we don't do anything, um, we don't behave as if that's a big deal. And I think it's not. And I don't know why, but I think it's the saliva. We're protected, maybe it's the IgA. But uh, we get away with a lot of stuff in dentistry that an orthopedic surgeon couldn't believe anybody could get away with. And of course, this is a corollary. We're the only bones with teeth, and that's exactly why we don't have an epithelial covering over all of the bone. And uh, because we're so close, because we have those teeth, and also one of the things coming up, uh, because of all the extra trauma that we get in the jaws, we have, without a doubt, the most exposed bones of uh, all, all the rest of the skeleton combined. Uh, if you just think about the number of extractions we, uh, we have, um, it is uh, phenomenal that we don't have more 
uh, problems with exposed bone. And uh, right now we're in a world where bisphosphonate is being used to keep metastatic disease under check when it's in bone and it seems to work pretty well. However, uh, the jaws have a special problem. And some of the things that I've added to my list are because of all the research of what makes alveolar bone different from the rest of the bones in the body. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But uh, if you have exposed bone, if you irradiate a bone somewhere else in the body, it would be extremely unlikely for that overlying soft tissue to break down. And the reason it breaks down, of course, is because the cortical bone loses its viability. It doesn't happen very much. And yet it has happened uh, pretty routinely in the old days in the jaws. When I got to WVU, um, I got to working with the radio radiotherapists and um, saw their records, and it was like 30% of all of their cases went on to osteonecrosis of the jaws, 30% of their head and neck cancer cases that were irradiated. Now it's down around one half of a percent, so it's a much uh, smaller problem. But that's not much of a problem in the rest of the body, and they're using the same doses of radiation. Uh, maybe you are aware of this, but if you have a lousy immune system because you're protein deficient and you, maybe you get pneumonia and you use up what little immune system you have before it can replenish itself, all the bugs in your mouth start to become enemies and they start chewing on you. Um, usually it's not just because you have gingivitis. You typically have to bite your cheek or do something like that and then these bugs get into an ulcer and we call that disease Noma. Uh, there are lots of diseases out there, of course, in uh, people who are very malnourished. But Noma is a very serious problem, 50% mortality rate, but it typically is associated with the oral cavity. And it gets out into the soft tissues and will destroy the soft tissues and then destroy the bone. Canker morris is another term for it. And uh, back in the old days, 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, we had, we had bisphosphonate, osteonecrosis. But it was from phosphorus, not bisphosphonate. And with the dentists of the time, who were mostly physicians from what I have read, and I've read pretty much everything for the first 30 years of modern dentistry, um, they called it fossy jaw. And it was from using, from making this brand new thing, wonderful thing called a safety match. Uh, at that time, radium was also, a little bit after that time, radium was invented and uh, so radiation was used in dentistry. Just the first paper on dental radiation came out just a month after the first medical um, x-ray paper came out. But this radium was literally sold. You could go to a grocery store and pick up a little bottle of radium and you were supposed to drink it swallow a little bit every day to make you really healthy. And the guy who was manufacturing that, I think Dave Kennedy was telling me that earlier today, um, his whole family died of radiation therapy, uh, radiation uh, poisoning. And uh, radium was just uh, very, very commonly used. And as a matter of fact, uh, the, there were women who were making radium dialed watches in order to make the letters glow in the dark. Mostly it was for entertainment when the uh, World War I and then eventually World War II came into existence. They were also very, very important for uh, pilots, for example, to be able to tell time at night. But uh, they had so much osteonecrosis, what we might call bisphosphonate and osteonecrosis, where their entire jaw or large parts of it were exposed, that it was called the radium jaw. And it was one of the first um, grassroots movements to improve the health of young people. It started in England and came over here and uh, they were forced to uh, get away from those technologies or change the manufacturing techniques. So another thing that is uh, you're kind of seeing a pattern here because we've got the teeth and we have that lack of epithelial covering uh, we have more infections than all the other bones combined, absolutely. If you get an infection in a long bone, it very often, if, unless it's caught very early, you are going to lose your leg, your finger, your arm, whatever uh, bone is involved. Osteomyelitis is a pretty uncommon problem outside of the head and neck area. 
it is certainly a problem, and in young kids, it's more of a problem because it's bloodborne. Their osteomyelitis is mostly de delivered to their bone from the bloodstream, whereas for adults, it's because of that exposed bone. You have a piece of bone sticking out of the skin, and it gets infected that way. Well, essentially, a periapical granuloma is osteomyelitis. There's no other, if you look at the uh, hist histopathology, there's nothing else you can call it. It may have more or fewer numbers of neutrophils, so we might call it acute versus chronic osteomyelitis, but it's still an osteomyelitis, and I, I uh, chide my uh, endodontic friends uh, about using the term uh, apical periodontal infection, and because it's not the periodontal origin in medicine, if you want to identify a specific osteomyelitis, you identify it by cause. Uh, so tuberculosis osteomyelitis, for example. So this should be dental ospe osteomyelitis or odontogenic osteomyelitis. But that's all, we all know what we're talking about. Well, if you look at the picture, picture from an old journal, I've kind of colorized it, but you see that bone around that apical tissue and uh, there's a little hollow space uh, that was not a cyst that just there was full of it was full of pus and it washed out during our uh, lab processing and then there's a bit of fibrosis which helps to wall it off and then surrounding that there is a thicker than normal layer of bone and that this power you're not going to be able to to that relate to that but you are I can tell you, as somebody who's very interested in bone and inflammatory bone changes, I can tell you that that's immature bone. It's not normal at all. It is not the normal lamina dura. And I have looked at uh, bone. If you give me a periapical infection, I, and, and you scoop bone, Scoop, scoop out a big chunk of bone, I literally might shout in my office because, hey, I, I'm studying that stuff and it's so seldom that we get a large piece of bone in a periapical lesion. It's almost all soft tissue. So I, I've looked at uh, about 75 or 80 of them and every single one is immature, newly forming bone. And I think that's the only reason why we can wall off infections. The jaws are almost the only bones in the body that have these walled off infections. And I'll tell, tell you later on uh, why that happens. It comes out of the, uh, the bisphosphonate research. And finally, I understand. Number one, this bone, the alveolar bone in particular, turns over much more rapidly than the rest of the skeleton. Uh, usually it's at least five times more rapid. Some people, some animals, it's 20 times more rapid turnover of bone. And without that rapid turnover, I don't think you're going to, I don't think you're going to uh, end up with the ability to wall off something. So we have a fibrous capsule around this stuff. The fibers are always there just before you get to the bone. So that is a help to keep it walled off. And then you have this immature bone. And even though you may have had a periapical granuloma there for years, it's still immature bone. It looks like the bone I would see in a socket three to five weeks after you extracted the tooth. So it is the only way that I think we can wall off an infection in the bone. If it wasn't for that, the infection from a, of a dead tooth would cause a whole mandible, for example, to just be destroyed, just like in the leg. It goes from one end of a leg bone to another, makes hundreds of holes in the cortex. You have tons of pus draining to the outside. And with us, most of the time, we don't even, we'll, we'll get a few fistulae coming to the outside, but without a fistulous tract, uh, we don't really have even any evidence of inflammation on the surface. So it's a weird, weird phenomenon and, I th phenomenon, and I think that it is probably a pretty common phenomenon. And I say that because in 2010, uh, in the journal Bone, the top journal in that field, these guys from the University of Maryland, a couple of young oropathologists and a couple of periodontists, decided to look at the bone that they were removing immediately before they put an implant in, edentulous, long edentulous sites. 
and they took a core sample out and just looked at it histologically. And they found 16% of those had chronic osteomyelitis, 16%. And chronic osteomyelitis is something I've been dealing with for three, four decades almost now. And uh, until recently, it wasn't in the literature. It was considered uh, only if you happen to catch it in between acute bouts of osteomyelitis. And uh, when I would talk to my oral surgery friends, they would kind of throw their hands up. No, if you call it osteomyelitis, I have to uh, put the patient in the hospital or put them on an IV drip, things of that nature. But chronic osteomyelitis has become a real thing now. And it's uh, not, not it, it is different from our, our standard mindset for osteomyelitis. It can sit and fester, I think, for a lifetime. So it's just a fibrous background, and the, limb, and the bone itself is alive and well. So chronic fibrosis and osteomyelitis is a name that I made up for it many, many years ago. And uh, a friend of mine, Wes Shanklin in Ohio, uh, got bacterial cultures from a whole bunch of these, and he runs a facial pain clinic, and virtually everyone was positive. There's no one bug that is associated with this. So it may be associated with... Uh, the body's ability or cellular ability to respond. And does this happen anywhere else in the body? Yes, in a rare case, usually in middle-aged individuals, sometimes in young individuals, you see that picture in the bottom, Brody's abscess. Brody's abscesses look exactly like pyogenic granulomas. They can have focal pus areas, most of the time, it is just uh, edema, vascularity, and lymphocytes. And it lasts forever. It can be painful many times. Most of the time, it's non-painful. And it's walled off. This is, uh, the, in, in the, the orthopedic literature, they're still scratching their heads. Why does this remain in one place only? And uh, they don't know. Uh, they, I have my theories about what the similar thing that goes on in the jaws, but they haven't got a clue, and I don't have a clue relative to this particular thing. But the other pictures show typical osteomyelitis where the bone just is destroyed randomly in all different directions. So there is a long bone equivalent to a periapical granuloma, and that is called Brody's abscess. Very, very uncommon. Well, in, in addition to more trauma, we have more infections. I mean, in addition to more infections, we have more trauma than any other bones. If you've ever hit somebody with your fist, you didn't, hit, you didn't try to hit the shoulder, you didn't try to hit their hip bone. You, you went right for the jaws. And uh, that is a very common reason for uh, people to go into emergency rooms. And if you look at uh, fractures, about seven million fractures every year have occurred recently, and uh, if that compares about 10 million third molar extractions, not the other teeth. So that is a form of fracture when you take a tooth out. You have all the same issues that a fracture has to go through in order to resolve itself. And uh, mandibular fractures, to put it in perspective, it's the 10th most common bone fracture in humans. And most of the time it's either an auto accident or um, somebody got in a fist fight. We're also the only bones that are usually inflamed and usually and or ischemic. Remember that study I just showed you about, 16% had low-grade chronic osteomyelitis. That same group found over a third of their implant sites had non-viable or what they called osteonecrotic bone. So here we are, you put those together and that means over half of all of these edentulous sites did not heal properly when those teeth were removed. And now it's years or decades later, and why didn't that happen? Why didn't it heal properly? We don't know, and it doesn't seem to affect the uh, success of implants. Nobody's done that study yet. But just think about it. Um, many of us are putting implants into bone, and it's certainly not good, healthy bone. Uh, there's also uh, considerable overlap between ischemia and inflammation in bone. I think I can tell the difference most of the time, but I've looked at about 18,000 plus bone marrow samples from the jaws, so I've got a little more experience than others. 
Uh, if you want to, you see that bottom line, if you want more information about this whole business of inflammation and ischemia, uh, I have a folder called Troubled Bones uh, with about 12 or 13 uh, PowerPoint modules on different topics related to this. And uh, you're welcome to get that. That's all copyright free. You just send me an email and I can give you the, the link. One thing that we are showing is not only do we have more ischemia than other bones, but the mandible in particular is the most ischemic of all bones. And this doesn't, this isn't, I'm, I'm confirming it now, but this goes back to the 19, early 1970s. And uh, if you look back at the 1970 literature, it was mostly cadavers. I've been working with cadavers, but uh, we, we've been finding uh, routinely ischemic bone, what we see in the um, two right-hand pictures, or left-hand pictures, this brown stuff, this is fatty marrow, we all have fatty marrow, we don't have red marrow, hematopoietic marrow, or very few of us. And uh, this brown stuff is uh, essentially mushy. You can get in there and scoop it out with your finger, that's how mushy it is. And you can look at the radiographs of these two bones, they don't show up on x-rays. Very, very seldom. It's a bone marrow problem. Yes, the bone may have lost some of its osteocytes, but it's not really something that is visible radiographically. And of course, uh, you see coursing through this stuff is a brown, frayed, splayed nerve. So we are taking the inflammation or ischemia and we are just coating this whole nerve uh, so we deal with pain in dentistry, we're used to dealing with pain. I think the reason for it is because we've got these nerves in the jaws. Some of those early studies, by the way, uh, showed I think it was 8% of about 150 cadaver mandibles had absolutely no inferior alveolar, alveolar artery. It was gone. And the other kind of vascularity in the um, bone had to compensate for the lack of that. That doesn't happen in other bones. That's pretty unique to the mandible. And also, uh, if you have ischemia, there's only one way that I know of to get a hollow space, like a traumatic bone cyst, and that is to slowly cut off the blood flow. The word cavitation is from orthopedic literature, and it's used to, they're the ones who are saying you can only see this when you cut off the blood flow. And they've got animal models to prove that. But it's a bony void, uh, and I uh, found bony voids very, very frequently. In uh, cadavers, uh, we found it in about a third of uh, 78, I think, cadavers that we've looked at. And uh, I did a study on dried skulls uh, with a, an ortho resident. I was his advisor, and he was going to cut them lengthwise, or cut them uh, from right to left from the uh, ramus to the anterior. So I said, well, can I take a look? Let's take some x-rays first, and I'd like to take a look, see if I can find these hollow cavities. And uh, here's one I'm showing you on top where really the entire mandible was hollow. And 40% uh, of those dried skulls, dried mandibles, had hollow spaces inside. And you and I, we're not gonna be able to see that radiographically. You have to, the only way you're gonna see a hollow space radiographically is if the area where the trabeculae contact the cortex are smoothed out or somehow destroyed. And this leaves those areas intact, this kind of destruction. Traumatic bone cyst is a young person's problem. If you are an older person's problem, you have about a 70% chance that it's producing pain, whether it's in the jaws or the hip or in the, um, the knees. Those are the three most likely places to have ischemic bone disease. And uh, regardless of whether it's there, you also have a very high risk of having multiple, and usually bilateral involvement. And uh, in the jaws, I found it about 70% of the time, there's one on the other side if you uh, have a, we'll say a tuberosity lesion. And in the hip, if you have one of these entities with either a hollow space or other ischemic kinds of bone marrow problems, you have an 80% chance of the other hip getting involved with the same thing. So uh, if, you are, if this hollow space is in the hip, then osteocavitation is the word that's used. 
Uh, my colleagues, many of them here in this room, use the word cavitation for what I think of as uh, chronic ischemic medullary disease. Uh, I don't it's not a diagnosis, cavitation to me, it's a term, a descriptive term of what's going on. And if you look at that lower picture, it's the same kind of a thing, but it's cavitated bone, it's hollow, but the trabeculae, which are perfectly alive microscopically and covered by a thin layer of fibers, the trabeculae are still intact. And uh, so this happens, the uh, cutoff of blood flow was so slow that the marrow either disappeared or turned to fibrous tissue, a little tougher, uh, can, and can withstand ischemia more. So I had to make up a name. I just called it honeycomb bone. If you have a better name for it, I would appreciate it because I'm writing a paper about that right now. So we've got more of these vo voids than uh, any other part of the body, I think more than the entire skeleton combined. And sort of a variant of this is focal loss of osteoporosis. Uh, when, we, when I was young in dental school in my early years, we called it um, focal hematopoietic marrow. And then I uh, published a paper with 600 of these cases and 80% of them were fatty marrow, so we had to change the name. And focal osteoporosis or focal osteoporotic marrow defect is the name that seems to have stuck. This is uh, essentially what happens. It's another thing that happens when the blood flow cutoff is much more slow than uh, the kind that we see with the hollow spaces. But I, it's not unusual to see small hollow spaces in the bone marrow with these focal osteoporotic defects. Do we see these in long bones? No. Now that the involved and the radiologists are producing diagnoses. You can have your hip replaced today without a pathologist ever looking at your tissue. Radio this is bone marrow edema and you lose your hip and they're pretty much right. And they're getting more and more sophisticated. Their computers can interpret things for, for them and they're coming up finally with the similar kind of things in people who have osteoarthritis in their hips. They haven't got a name for it, but I think for us, most of the time, this is an extraction site that just didn't heal properly. Not all the time, but most of the time. And uh, that's another pretty unique thing. We wouldn't have that in another bone because there are no teeth in other bones. There is a focal osteoporotic marrow defect that is just like what we get in the jaws, and it occurs just downstream from an old fracture that didn't heal properly or took a long time to heal. And there'd be a little one or two centimeter radiolucency. So similar kind of a, a problem. And uh, all of this is associated with some, when do I, by the way, somebody wave your hand when it's time for me to stop because I just keep going. Uh, number 11 is a real doozy. I'm not sure if you knew this. I didn't know this until I was in my 40s. But there ain't no nerves in other bones. The only nerves are those, I think of them as telephone wires, reticulum fibers that we can't even see. They're so small, they're invisible without special reticulum stains. And uh, they follow the blood vessels and they tell the vessels to open or close. That's their whole function. And I have had people with, uh, I've looked in their jaws, looked over the oral surgeon's shoulders, and the mandible, for example, completely hollow, like that dried skull that I showed you. Completely hollow. There is no nerve in there. And yet I can poke on their, their lips and, and pinch them, and they feel perfectly normal. They'll say, ouch, or I can feel your finger. And I think it's the reticulum fibers that somehow were taken over and allowed to adapt. I don't know that for sure. But just think about it. We have, oh. Is that a sign that I'm done? That's not a nice way to treat it, you know. But we have, um, we did a study back in the 90s where for the first time somebody invented an antibody test or test for an antibody against myelin. 
We had no way to know uh, what was going on, but it just makes sense. If you have a disease that uh, kind of eats up the, the wall of the alveolar neurovascular bundle, or even if it doesn't, the chemicals can easily get through that. And uh, what's inside could be vascular damage, but more frequently it's neural damage. And that's easy to tell because we have special, we've all long had special stains for myelin. And uh, it typically see about half of the myelin gone when I see a nerve in one of these ischemic or inflammatory lesions in the jaw. But this study came up, uh, we called the guy who had reported this uh, antibody technique, antibody detection technique. He was so fascinated, he said, I'll do 50 cases for free. And he did. And uh, he said, you know, some of your people, these are all the pain cases that we were dealing with, but uh, bone marrow problems, ischemia mostly. And he was saying, some of your people have antibody levels as high as Guillain-Barre which is one level below uh, multiple sclerosis. And about 40% of those individuals had some kind of elevated antibodies against their own myelin. So it's like a, like a devil's disease. Uh, get rid of the insulation, and now you've got all these lousy electrical signals just going on live wires. And it's a good way to produce pain, a good way to produce this shocking sensation through your face and things of that nature. And um, we published that, but it was not really the best paper because uh, about that time we also got um, new, new technology that made the study better and we just ran out of time and maybe money. Well, so we've got, we're the only bones with a nerve inside and it's a doozy of a nerve. The trigeminal nerve the sensory input from the trigeminal nerve is estimated to take up 40% of all of the sensing power in your brain. And it's going on all the time. That's how you can get just so close in your bite without actually crushing the lower tooth or uh, an upper tooth. And it uh, apparently takes a lot of really fine-tuned concentration or interpretation through that nerve. So it's a very important nerve and it isn't, isn't it interesting, if you look at uh, where the facial, or where the uh, things called neuralgia are in the body, 85% of them, this is not my thinking, this is from the medical literature, 85% of all neuralgias are in the head and neck area. Maybe it has something to do with the bone marrow, I don't know. So, it is uh, just an interesting phenomenon, and going back to the 1800s, if you had trigeminal neuralgia, what we call trigeminal neuralgia today, you may have been diagnosed with odontalgia, or odontogenic neuralgia, because the physicians back then were assuming there was some, the tooth was somehow related. Also, it surprised me, um, maybe it'll surprise you, but we get fibrous scar tissue all the time, right? Uh, periapical scars are what? Eight, nine, 10% of all endo cases end up with periapical scars. But did you know you don't get scars inside the bone anywhere else in the body? Unless you break the bone and now we have fibroblasts coming in from the surface. That's the only explanation. And a periapical scar kind of fits that pattern, right? We've got some access to the outside world there. But in, a, in these 18,000 plus bone marrow biopsies I have looked at, I have probably eight or 900,000 examples of what I had to make up a name. It looked, I called it intramedullary fibrous scar tissue. It's just one or some clusters of uh, marrow spaces are full of just dense avascular fibrous scar tissue. And that has not been reported in any other bone. It's only in the jaws. And I think these are old extraction sockets. I don't know for sure, but it, somebody, it makes sense. Uh, the, the tooth was removed, the epithelium healed on top, uh, but the socket itself didn't heal properly. It might have healed enough so you just see a little round uh, radiolucency uh, not very well defined, but if you go in and remove it, it's fibrous scar tissue. Can be se several other things as well. 
And here is an autopsy case. Um, this person actually, in his suicide note, because he had so much pain, in his suicide note, he dedicated his head to Dr. Boko. <laughs> Um, most of you don't get into those kinds of situations, but that happened to me. And I had to figure out how to get the head from Indiana to West Virginia. And fortunately, I had some friends over there who were willing to help. But he wanted me to cut up his face and uh, see if I could figure out why he had this trigeminal neuralgia. He had atypical facial neuralgia in one quadrant, trigeminal in another. And the one with the trigeminal is shown here. You see the arrows in this gross picture. It's all dense fibrous scar tissue, and it's an outline of an old extraction, and uh, it had been seven or eight years since he had had any teeth. His teeth were lost because of perio, any remaining teeth were lost because the dentist thought maybe that'll help his pain. So edentulous, the uh, area up going into the sinus was fibrous scar tissue, there was no bone. The area coming down into the mouth was fibrous scar tissue, there was no bone. So here's a gross example of what I call a residual socket. That's something very, very unique. Uh, also, this is different from the, what I usually deal with, but I am the only person who's, uh, well, not the only, but the first person who reported uh, salivary glands within the bone itself. Uh, certainly, we have ton, tons of them all around the outside, but, and we've had malignancies, salivary malignancies and salivary pleomorphic adenomas reported inside the mandibles especially with no perforation of the outside, no metastasis, no explanation for why it was there. And then because I've seen so many bone marrow samples, uh, I reported on a couple dozen cases of little mucus glands just stuck in the middle of uh, bone marrow, medullary spaces. We do have epithelial rests that everybody knows about, malassase, the rest of malassase in the periodontal ligament, and some of that can be entrapped when the bone gets healed. But at least this gives us an explanation. I just saw another one that showed up very well on, uh, on a radiograph, and I think I've probably seen over 100 of these uh, chorostomas, when you have normal tissue but in the wrong place. So uh, we have all of these epithelial rests, and if you're going to have all these epithelial rests, adonogenic and salivary, then you should be a bone that has a lot of tumors and a lot of cysts. And we not only have more in terms of numbers of both tumors and cysts inside the bone than all the rest of the bones combined, but we have more variety, more different names, more different types of cysts. And that's because so many of this, uh, the tumors and the cysts come from these little epithelial rests, adonogenic or salivary. That makes sense. And of course, uh, we passed, uh, what was it, in 2010, the dental profession passed the medical profession in the number of implants. Now, maybe they were smaller than <laughs> what was put in, but uh, that was back in 2010, so you can imagine what it is now. The numbers that uh, I have there are supposedly from, I think, two years ago. So uh, even if we're looking at hip replacements and knee replacements, uh, dental implants uh, are much higher than that. And these are only uh, the ones that were self-reported in a study. So we're worried a lot about, uh, about amalgam, mercury. We've talked about this. Uh, in this session, or in these kinds of sessions, in this meeting over and over again. Uh, we're not putting mercury into our dental alveolus, but do we know the effects of the material we're putting in? I don't know, uh, some of you who are, might remember that when hip replacement first hit the scene, it was gonna save, and it did save a lot of people, but about 10, 15 years later, they ran into big trouble because of the coating, the chemical coatings, essentially, on the outside. And they're still working with new kinds of coating all the time. I've got bad arthritis in my knees, had it since dental school. And my orthopedic surgeon, who's somebody I really admire and respect, told me uh, he's not going to put an implant in until I have so much pain that I I beg him to put an implant in. And so I've been living with a lower level of pain, maybe three, three out of 10 scale, 
for a long, long time. And the reason he doesn't want that is because, and he's the, the chair of the department, the reason he doesn't want it is because of the constant continuing improvement and the questions about did these improvements help or did we cause some damage. So I think it's early days to know exactly where we are with all of our implants, but uh, there are some people with a lot of foreign material in their alveolar bones and um, it seems to be needed, necessary. I'm not complaining about doing implants. I've got one of my own, uh, which by the way, for seven months, my uh, central incisor, I gave probably 80 or 90, maybe 100 hours of Zoom to people all over the world, Zoom seminars, and I just had to smile and apologize for my hole in my, my, my mouth. Um, so it's been a fairly new experience for me. So um, right now there are some papers that show that uh, certain particular implants are producing issues, producing problems, but uh, it'll just be a long, long time, probably 10 or 20 years before we know if we're doing more harm than good. And then uh, we've talked about this before, but it, it is a special thing that makes the jaws very unique, and it's only alveolar bone. It's not the inferior alveolar border, for example. And uh, this is the, f the fact that it's got faster turno turnover than any other bones in the body. And I've already mentioned five to 20 times uh, greater turnover. If, uh, if we didn't have that, we would be in super big trouble. I'm absolutely certain. Somebody would get a periapical abscess and we'd be scraping out their entire mandible from it, but it doesn't happen. So we think we're pretty good um, at solving problems, uh, but it's really Mother Nature who's helping us out in this regard. So the end result is any infection we get remains almost always very localized. And uh, if it doesn't remain localized, from my experience, it's because there's been a lousy blood flow or the patient has clotting issues that has caused some lousy blood flow. So uh, it is, Never, I take that back, I have seen one wall around a periapical granuloma that had mature bone. I have seen these walls around periapical granulomas that had some lymphocytes out here in the bone marrow, just a few, so some of the inflammation obviously is getting through, and looking at them histologically is not the best technique for that, but I'm pretty amazed. Uh, this bony wall, which is always active, the osteoblasts are always busy, seem to protect the surrounding marrow because the back, the marrow behind it is perfectly normal. No problem whatsoever, in my experience again. So uh, this is maybe no big deal, but if you know about other bones, you realize that if you get an infection in your body, you're gonna have to have the neutrophils go out millions at a time. And so a typical lymphatic vessel just isn't going to allow that to happen. So there are things called sinusoids within bone marrow, the hematopoietic marrow. In fatty marrow, the kind of stuff we have in the jaws, uh, we don't have very many sinusoid, sinusoids. But in the jaws, because of the teeth involved, whether the teeth are still there or not, we do have true lymphatics. So there are a few issues that maybe are associated with that, but frankly, it hasn't been studied well enough for me to say that um, what those issues are. And uh, finally, again, something that I didn't realize until well into my uh, experience, well into my career, is that we have not only a higher prevalence of cortical masses than any other bones, we have a massively higher presence of cortical masses. We take tori to be um, just for granted. Um, so many people have tori. There's some studies, depending on how large a torus you expect or you accept for your study, there's some studies that have 15% of us with palatal tori, for example. Buccal exostoses are very, very common. Uh, I wasn't even taught about buccal exostoses when I was in dental school. And they're all related to the odd shape and the, the pressures that we put on this system. Uh, if you torque your mandible, if you have malocclusion and you clench your mandible together, then the place where the torque is going to be greatest 
is right there on the lingual of the premolar and the molar. And if you torque a bone, you're going to increase the number of electrons on the surface of that bone. And the way to stimulate new bone is to get a bunch of electrons on the surface of that bone. If you break a leg and it's not healing, your orthopedic surgeon might put a wire on the bottom and a wire on top and put a little electric charge across that fracture line to help with the healing. Uh, it's so little electricity that you don't even feel it. So we're not talking about something that you can sense. But that makes sense. And how can we explain electrical charges uh, producing a palatal torus? Well, as you get older, I'm sure it happened to me, if you get older, the outside of your skull falls. And in some individual, it's about a centimeter lower than it was when you were young. And that puts different pressures on the middle of your, your uh, because the whole skull obviously is held up by the uh, structures in the middle. And as part of that whole process, uh, one of the theories for trigeminal neuralgia is now this skull base is angled. The nerve that goes down to the trigeminal nerve that goes through its foramina is going to be stretched. And that produces pain. It, it's not only going to be stretched, but now it'll be pushed up against the artery and it'll be pounded by the artery. So that's one explanation, probably a common explanation for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, so maybe the pressure there is from the septum pushing down on the heart palate. I have no other explanation. And if anybody here has one, I wouldn't mind hearing about it. Well, we've got tori, we've got buccal exostoses. There is an exostosis in long bones where the tendon attaches to the long bone. And if you're running a marathon, for example, you might get it in your, uh, your usually it's one of the lower leg bones. But the formal term for that is osteochondroma, and you can see the upper picture is an osteochondroma. This purple is cartilage. You develop essentially a small end of a bone. And uh, this is found in about 5% of children. It goes away as people get a little bit older but that is the most common of all the other bone things uh, that we have in the mouth. And if you add up all the tori and buccal exostoses and reactive exostoses that we have in the jaws, I, I would say the number's up around 12 to 15%. And uh, just to let you know that there are some other bony bumps that uh, do occur. Uh, the one that I like the most is surfer's ear here in the middle. And I tried, I've read, trying to figure out what makes it. This is in the inner ear or the external auditory canal. And it's almost exclusive to people who surf. <laughs> and you have to tell me how that can be. Why do we get a bony bump in there? I'm assuming there's inflammation of the mucous membrane and you get a little mass formation as a cortical response. But I have no clue. But these are the other kinds of things that we will see. And uh, you might have noticed that I was careful getting up. I have picked up uh, muscular dystrophy in my ripe old age. So uh, if you see me walking around and wobbling, that's the reason. But so far, so good. Um, I'm, I've gotten three or four different surefire treatments given to me, my friends here, <laughs> just this morning. And uh, I'll probably try some of those. But right now, I'm using just electromagnetic pulses. Uh, twice a day, I lay down on a beamer pad. and. It has, uh, I think, pretty well stopped the progress for the last four years. Okay, if you have any questions uh, and you want a copy of this, um, or if you would like to go to my Boco to Go files, they're all copyright free pictures in there, about close to 4,000 of them. Uh, you're welcome to put some of those on your uh, website if you want a scientific looking website with lesions on it. <laughs> but, um, that, that is, has been available for a long, long time. Very popular. Uh, of course, it's free, so it's going to be popular. Any questions at all? No time for questions.